Welcome to What's Left, a weekly political discussion challenging the mainstream left. I'm Eduardo Barca with co-host, teacher and socialist Andy Lipson, and community organizer and socialist Kenny Cepeda. Uh, we are online at what-s-left.webnone.com. Uh, remember to turn on your notifications. Uh, please subscribe, rate, review, and best of all, share any episode that is your favorite one. Uh, today we will be discussing uh, the aftermath of the elections from yesterday, which was the election day here in the USA, and uh, our take on it, as well as uh, maybe predictions, maybe. Who knows? It's too close of a call, no? I, I do want to say something. Uh, you're not um, speaking of my forced exile and that I'm back. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny <laughs> we invited Kenny back for an episode or two you know uh, and I also survived an assassination attempt so it's fine <laughs> <laughs> you said by Andy That's <laughs> I don't know I'm trying to find out who it was so we'll see. Right. I had nothing to do with it <laughs> now, obviously no one's paying attention to me because the elections are happening and you know <laughs> So yeah, I mean, what is it? What today? so today is Wednesday? Uh, elections yeah. happened yesterday. So I read some articles today regarding, um, you know, the st statistics, polls, and how they were wrong again. Obviously, the results are not in. Uh, the elections are a lot closer than people thought. I think, especially on the left, um, we haven't decided. Uh, it's Wednesday. There is uh, there is no announcement as to who's the president. I think that um, we are gonna, we're in it for a little while. There will be challenges, legal challenges to um, to the results. I mean, they, they still have to be certified and legitimized. And so I still think we're in it for a little longer. It's gonna, it's gonna take a second to actually um, get an official answer as to who is the next president. I've forgot my prediction if it was going to be Biden or Trump. What was it I when we think, did the <laughs> Yeah, I think you thought Trump was going to win. Yeah. I think what I'm most impressed by is the number of the turnout of voters that broke all records because this is during the pandemic and you would expect that most people would sort of be um, deterred from voting. But there were record numbers of folks that were in the queue voting mail-in ballots that were encouraging others. So I, I think that's my first impression, if, if, if anything. It's, it's more than by then, because for me, I do consider this to be I do, as people know already, I do consider voting to be something of a tool that we can use in the system so we can hold back or as a buffer um, any um, long-term damages. I am surprised, though, in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken, there have, last I checked, the, the, the um, voter turnout wasn't very high. And Donald Trump, supporters here in San Francisco actually came out greater in numbers than they were in 2016. Of course, nothing in comparison to liberals, but still the fact that they, their turnout was higher and San Franciscan voters were, the turnout was lower than 2016. I thought that, that was interesting. My, my, um, my uh, my second um, sort of um, um, where I was also looking at um, was the propositions, and unfortunately, Prop Twenty Two did not pass. Uh, lots of money was funneled into that proposition from uh, uh, Ly uh, Lyft and Uber and other gig economy uh, apps. Uh, so. I guess that that's where I, I'm a little not sure. I'm not sure how to feel about that. Obviously, I would like it to have been passed, but yeah, I'll leave that as that. 
as for the presidency, well, I guess I think it's an interesting thing to look at the country and seeing how states have been flipped. Um, I know that people think in binary terms, but I'm also thinking about how Latino voters came out. Uh, and that's an interesting one for me, just seeing that how the demographics of this country is changing. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. At that. And do you mean when you say because when the Latino voters came out, because there's been a story about how more Latino and actually black voters came out for Trump than last election, and and there were fewer white voters that did for Trump. That was one of the things. Is that what you mean, or or just the number of Latino voters? Uh, there the, the the number of Latino voters that have come out in general, whether they voted for Republican or Democrat, it's the demographics are just changing in this country. And I think people are try, are in denial that this country's uh, sort of um, going to remain the same way it was in the, in the back in the 60s or <clears throat> 50s. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely changing. And I think I was just impressed by how many Latinos came out. Uh, and uh, that's it. I, I, yeah, but whether they voted for a de Democrat or Republican, uh, Yes, I, I I did see something where Latinos, especially in Florida, uh, really came out in support of Trump. Um, I think for me, um, I guess I'll talk about. So you know, my partner Brandy was pretty bummed last night when it looked pretty clear that Trump had the elect was looking to build an electoral mar margin when it was like Georgia and North Carolina and Pennsylvania possibly um, Michigan. Um, and it just looked, you know, cause every, it is true. That's like what, it, what, it, what Kenny said was if you, if you just listen to mainstream media, it was, it looked like there was going to be a, a complete blue wave. Right. And that, that's not at all what was, what we saw in, at least if you believe those election results that come in. Um, and I, I was like, for me, the only surprising outcome given the things I had read, would have been a Biden concession speech in the face of what looked like an, another defeat. Because uh, what, what, what was confirmed for me in this election, and the reason I'm, I've been somewhat in a good mood today, is um, we live in a dictatorship, not a democracy. <laughs> I, not that I'm happy about that. That's cap but it, it's nice to know Marxism works because it explains what we're seeing. Um, like I said, I've been, I use this term that we live in what is called the dictatorship, the bourgeoisie, and that's not a throwaway term. That is what we live in. And what we are seeing is the, is the expression of that. You are, we are not looking at, a, at an election that's decided by votes. We are looking at an election which is decided by a process that's truly governed by the capitalist class. Because while the pollsters all were wrong about what was gonna happen, people like Whitney Webb, who were looking at meetings that were taking place in the transition, what was it called, the Transition Integrity Project. These meetings happened in June, literally predicted this outcome right here. Um, now, that transition project had many scenarios. What if Biden gets a big electoral uh, win? What if he gets a partial electoral win? What if Trump wins, at least electorally? You know, they, they, they role-played all of those scenarios um, and said that the one thing they, that Trump, that Biden cannot do is is give up in any election, um, and here were some of the the their their take actually their starting points for when they thought about preparing for the election was this number one that the concept of election night is no longer accurate and is indeed dangerous, and that the 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 people for democracy uh, that who make up the transition integrity project have to wage a determined campaign they said a determined campaign that has the opportunity to contest the election into January, 2021. Um, and they expected that the, the transition process itself would be highly disputed. So here they lay out the plan. The plan is for a contested election. And they say, they say this, approach this as a political battle, not a legal battle. In the event of an electoral contestation, sustained political mobilization will likely be crucial for ensuring what they call transition integrity. And they say, focus on readiness in the states, providing political support for a complete and accurate count. The three states they pointed to in this thing back in June 
were Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina, and Michigan as states where they have Democratic governors that they could count on the control of those states, allowing them to push the agenda that they wanted to push, or make sure democracy happens, make sure the votes are counted. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Um, and they say this, the goal of the TIP, the Transition Integrity Project, is to highlight these various electoral and transition related risks and to make recommendations to all actors, individuals and institutions who share what they say is a commitment to democracy and the rule of law. The recommendations shared here reflect input from both Republicans and Democrats committed to those values. And that to me is that final line. And again, these, this is written in June, predicting the very thing that's happening right now as we see a contested election, which is gonna go into June, 2021. This is being done, the, this protection of democracy you're watching right now is literally being run by neoliberal Democrats, because that's what they mean in this thing. That's like, you know, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama people and the neocons back in the Bush era, the same people who got elected using the election, the fraud, another fraudulent election in election 2000. So to me, what is confirmed here is that th this process was never gonna be decided by votes. This was always going to be decided by a ruling class that was going to make sure it's, it, it got the outcome it wanted. Now, there's another section of the ruling class that's behind Trump that's going to fight like hell to get what they want. But here's who doesn't matter in this. Voters, workers, people who voted. That doesn't matter to them. This is all a game that they're playing. They, and, and I think they even, they even say this out, outright in this document in this way. They say, Thinking about the upcoming presidential election, they say the more or the most important concept might be what they call the margin of contestation. In other words, what combination of factors might lead a candidate to conclude that contesting the election is or is not in, uh, in his interest? This is a dynamic and unpredictable calculation because the outcome is likely to be fought not only in the courts or by, the, by counting ballots, but possibly also in state legislatures, in Congress, and on the streets. And they say this, what happens before election day will to a large extent determine the margin of contestation. Reporters, pollsters, pundits, political parties, and many others will communicate confidence or concern about the legitimacy of this election. Uh, viral social media memes will also play a role. All right. They said during these exercising, exercises, winning the narrative emerged as the, as the potentially decisive factor. And that's how we have to understand this, that all those polls all this media and stuff like that has been about head fixing us to get it to this moment. And now everything we do, everything that happens now in the media, all this, let's watch the electoral votes. Let's see what's happening in Virginia and North Carolina. It's again, it's all a massive troll operation. If we go back to that previous episode, head fixing operation to get people to believe that this is a democracy. And it's not. This is a system. It's a sham system decided by elites. To, to rule over us. And that's what has been exposed in this entire process. Because that stuff she wrote was written in August and she's writing about the ruling class knowing in June that this day was gonna come and they were getting ready for it. And they were gonna make it happen. And they did and it's happening. And that's what's running this election, not votes. Is this mostly, are you considering the uh, presidential? Um, election, right? The whole thing, yeah. I mean, or uh, even yeah. just that's that's. I mean, yes, I'm talking about the, I'm talking about that first and foremost. Uh, the the entire process is a legitimate. The entire process is is a is a fraud and a sham. But I think it's most exposed um, by the, our presidential election. And I will tell you that the other the other analogy that these people make is to the is to the 19 or 1876 election. They say, look, this has happened in 2000. And by the way, what we're about to do here when we, when we try to like jockey, jockey using governors and say which, elector, which, which electors are gonna be able to go to the, um, what's that thing called, the election? Which people are gonna go there to be able to cast their vote for the particular president who's gonna get elected? The la there was a, some horse trading that went on in 18, um, 1876, right? And that was done before the Democratic Party that time conceded and said, okay, we won the presidential election, but we'll let you get elected as long as you take down Reconstruction and you allow the Klan to run rampant in this, in, in, through the South. Again, that was the Democratic Party. So in order to destroy Reconstruction, they, were, they, 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 they founded a deal in order to, 
to figure out who was going to be president using electoral college. And this is the historic precedent that these people cite as, hey, this has been done before and we can do it again. So these are the people, this is the system. It's been, and it's been, it's been a fraud way back since 1876. And there's a continuum of that. You can see they don't care at all about what traditions are, what has been done or what is done at all. They'll do anything they can to make sure that they get the outcome they want. And that's true for both sides, Trump and Biden. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the kind of comebacks to that that I usually hear is that the Republicans are cheaters. The Republicans are um, uh, keeping people of color out, right? The Republicans in Southern states. And you can see that in our very own state, you know, and, and especially in the Democratic prim primaries. 2016, this year in March, uh, a lot of ballots, you know, weren't counted um, to favor people that were running against Bernie Sanders. Obviously, I don't, I don't care for Bernie Sanders, but it just goes to show that there, there is a machinery that continuously manipulates, and not just in the general elections. It happens before all this. Uh, obviously, the Democrats demonstrated the massive manipulation in, in straight up corruption that we only think uh, happens in other countries. That a lot of people just think that this happens in, 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 in South American, South American dictators. But here we are. When we actually look dig deep, this thing runs deep. And it, it is the capitalist class manipulating all this. Even when you brought up the Proposition 22, Eduardo, just the fact that simple fact that money rules. I mean, you know, you just, just got to look at where the money is at and you'll see who, who wins. Um, it's kind of, you know, a basic fact with, it was with Obama. It might be with Biden, actually, the, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal celebrated when Kamala Harris was selected as vice president, you know, and they, they knew their, their plan, their, their, you know, the, the capitalist interests were secure either way, you know, so there is no stakes for us here. You know, we, we're, we're all losing, but here we are, we're trying to hold on to little hope that one is lesser bad than the other, that you know, one is more inclusive than the other. Uh, when in reality, we're all getting screwed in, and we're about to maybe like fight it out on the streets, you know, and people uh, while they're running the show. Yeah, I, there are areas of this where I agree. And uh, I, I, I know that when you mentioned Prop 22, Kenny, uh, uh, yeah, I, under this system, you're going to have financial interests backing up a lot of uh, propositions that are going to push forward their agenda to garner support for a specific legislation. It's not that I don't know that personally. It's just I hope that there is something to be done outside the ballot box and pass this election date. I, I actually do. Like this focus on Proposition 22, right, which involves workers, Uber workers, Lyft workers. You know, we're, stop asking for permission. Organize. Stop asking for permission from a capitalist state. Organize and run your own shit. You know, force their hand, bend them, bend their knee. So, but voting is that. It's asking for permission. It's begging. And it's every year. You know, wait your turn. Fight tomorrow. You know, and that's what Hema was talking about in the previous episode. Basically, you know, we do our own thing. We're not waiting for you to save us. You know, we organize. Well, I don't think that's what Hema was trying to say. I really... That's what I read. Like, you know, that basically that's what she's doing. She's not waiting for this system to fix our problems, the problems of our people. We're organizing to do stuff. Under a capitalist system, according to her, I, I don't think no, she's going yeah, I do have to get anywhere. In, but in, in essence, you have to organize. You know, in, in, in essence, you have to do it collectively. You cannot dictate that from the bottom up, you know. So you, you have to organize and we have no other choice. You know, and so I call that socialism. You know, we're going to have to do it collectively and, you know, and, and, and put things into the hands control. You know, I mentioned a few shows ago that here we are organizing, trying to feed people, 
trying to get people resources that uh, they are institutionally, you know, forced out of, and for many reasons, you know, there are many situations, there are some people that are more affected, some people that are more deeply affected, but overall people are screwed. And so what I'm saying here to my community is that we need space to organize. We're literally, right now, we, we do deliveries every Wednesday. And now this week, we had to push it to Sunday because we don't have the space. We have to go through city politics through, uh, because the federal government gives uh, you know, money to uh, pantries. And so they need information from undocumented immigrants. So we are saying no. So guess what? We have to use our own space. So what I'm saying is they take over spaces. Let's make it community owned. We're not asking you for permission. We're telling you what we're gonna do. So that's outside the ballot box. Like that does a lot more to shift the balance of power than any ballot box. The ballot box actually does the complete opposite. And then people have hurt feelings because you know they don't get the illusions they thought they, they wanted. Right, well, I mean, I think we've had this discussion before, Kenny. However, um, the, the food um, pantry, as well as the public education and healthcare is provided um, to folks that might need it in your community. So I, I just feel it might be disingenuous if we just dismiss those services as well. Of course not, but we're saying let's run it. Teachers run it the way they want it. Not waiting for the city officials to tell us to give us resources. There's plenty of money. This is not about more taxes. You know, I heard the last episode. This isn't about more money. This is about power and who gets to dictate what gets done. There's obviously plenty of money to tear gas the shit out of people on the streets, you know, to increase surveillance and all that BS, the coercive apparatus that really maintains the power of the capitalists. So there is money, it's about power. And unless we, are, we say, we're not playing your game, we're gonna keep, you know, this, this road. Yeah. So, one of the things that's going to happen now, um, because this election is is not going to be decided this week or in a few weeks, and um, one of the things that they that that this group, the TIP, say is like, well, there's going to be claims of voter fraud, and that's patently false. There is not voter fraud. It's it's excessively small in this in, in our democracy. That's not true. I agree with what Kenny said. The Republicans have a strategy for disenfranchising the vote. And uh, the Democrats have a strategy and they're slightly, they're different. Um, I think the Democrats work with electronic machines and they work with cleaning people off rolls. Those are their tactics and things like that. Um, they, they, they work on stuffing ballots, which happened in Iowa. Um, but the, the, and the Republicans do it by uh, gerrymandering, uh, not giving you the right to vote based on some ridiculous uh, reason um, and, and things like that. So both parties have their own strategies for shaping the electorate so that it has the outcome that they want. Um, but that's, but in, in neither party, in fact, both parties are de de dedicated to one thing, maintaining their power at all costs. Um, and if there ever was an independent threat coming, both parties would unite to, to smash it. Um, that, that, that's, the, that's the fact. Um, but one of the interesting things in this document was how much they saw the role they knew this, they recognized this was a political battle and how much they're really counting on mobilizing people. Um, again, I, we use the analogy in the episode that uh, around Bolivia, we talked, or I think I mentioned, and we kind of talked about how the methods that the U.S. Have, has used to break down, to, to take down um, presidents is a method they're about to use internally now. And they're doing, they're going to do it. They're talking about, like in this document, and remember, this is neoconservative Republicans. The neocons, right, who brought you George Bush Jr. and the, the Patriot Act and War on Terror, and the neoliberals who brought you, you know, structural adjustment and the neoliberal Democrats, most right-wing Democrats. These are the people who are talking about how do we mo mobilize Black Lives Matter? How do we mobilize the labor movement? How do we get people on the streets doing peaceful protests? I mean, they literally are talking like liberal... Um, protest organizers who want to figure out how to do it in a peaceful way, but that gets the maximum impact. So one of the things that's being talked about in, my, in, the, in the grand unions is a general strike if Trump doesn't, doesn't um, step down. Um, now, that, and that poses a question for people like me. 
because I want my I want a general strike. But a gen but let's be clear, a general strike that's essentially controlled by the Democratic Party is not a it, it, it's the opposite of independent. It is literally taking the working class's action and give, handing it over to the capitalist class. So the question is for me, for a, as a socialist, what do I do at a moment like this? Because I'm not going to give a shit whether you're whether it's uh, Bush, or I mean Biden or or Trump. I don't. Um, and mobilizing us for a general strike to get one versus the other to me seems pointless. Um, so I was thinking about that. I am thinking that that is something I would have to join and would have to be part of. But I'd have to figure out how to be part of it. Um, because there is that notion of it could get outside of their control and things like that. The prospects for that, at least with the apparatus we currently have, are very limited. Um, but I will say I would have to join such a, I, I would not go on strike if, if AFL called a, called, a, called a strike in order to make sure Biden got elected um, and make sure every vote got counted. Um, even though I think it's a dictatorship. So I don't think they count votes. They're counting they're, they're making up things in order to figure out what capitalist is going to rule us. Um, but I do think I need to participate. But again, it shows how, to me, if those, these actions that, that are going to take place are going to show how beholden our movements are to the capitalist parties. Um, and our role is to try to get them out from under that. Um, I think it's going to be very hard, but that's something I've been thinking about. I suppose, though, if there was a strike going on now, right? Like to, as to, for the people who said, uh, "Vote Trump out, fight Biden later." If there was, and Biden did win, then, and and there was a strike right now, right under a Biden administration, would you both then join as socialists? A, a a a a strike to oppose Biden or a strike to get Biden elected? No, not to get Biden elected uh, under a Biden administration. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll join any. I as I think about it, I would join any strike. The question I'm asking, and this is likely to come up actually either in later November or early December in the run up to the inauguration, if that pressure builds. Is there is going to be some sort of labor action um, in relationship to saying we want Trump out and we want the votes to be counted and Supreme Court to stay or to build put pressure on the Supreme Court? There's going to be some kind of labor action and not just a, a rally. It's going to be like I think they're going to do a, a, an actual general strike kind of thing um, if they feel like they need to, because the, both the Democrats and Republicans see the need to organize such a thing. Um, the question is, is what do I do with something like that? And I do think I would be involved, but how would I be involved in such a way as to not just be another chump? And how do I keep this movement from just being completely used? I don't know, but that that's a that's a big question for me. Uh, the way I see it, um, can you hear me? I don't know. I, um, it is, I, I look at power, where does power lie? Does that shift power dynamics? You know, um, that's what I think of revolution is it shifting you know, who's deciding. Um, in, I mean, I look at Chile, for example, obviously it's complicated, that's another thing. They just recently pushed to, or you can argue was the capitalist class um, conceding to um, uh, reform or what is it? Re redo the constitution, right, under Pinochet. Um, the, the, the issue in Chile started with, uh, it was a fair, a fair hike that precipitated everything, but it grew. It grew to other demands. Mm. And that's what I would want out of this moment. Not to like, concentrate on, on this shit that they want, but to put all our grievances on the floor. You know, we, we, there, there's massive support for, you know, universal healthcare. You know, why not? You know, for education, why not? You know, like all the things, the grievances that we have, need to be joining that. It cannot just stay to, to save their, their electoral system. No, but I would say, let's go for the throat. You know, let's go more, let's go bigger. You know, that's what I would push for. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm tired of single issue protests. You know, like I, I'm, what I'm saying is like, yes, like, you know, like I'm not, that's why I don't practice privileged politics.
six is like if you have grievances put them out there you know you have right to be mad you're getting fucked you know white people you black people you're getting fucked latinos you're getting fucked women you're getting fucked you know we're all getting fucked so i i, I would want to make it an opportunity to grow this into something bigger than just like their game you know again otherwise we're just playing their game i'm in agreement with you all that i i do think that some organizing has to happen under any administration. I just hope that if people do under a Biden administration feel very comfortable because they finally decided, oh, Biden is the right president and people start mobilizing, people start working um, or being active politically. Uh, I, I just, don't see how there will be much of movement uh, if if they do get comfortable. So I I, I hope and my and my appeal is to the public, whoever's listening to our small falling, that people don't just get uh, comfortable. That they, they don't get uh, they don't feel that the work is done and that the struggle is constant and you have to continue. And I, I just, that's where I, I, I hope the next step is, that's all. So as far as where you both were saying, if there was going to be any strike or any movement happening after this, uh, yes, I, I would agree and we should join those forces. Uh, I just really don't hope, I just, I just hope, I really hope, excuse me, I really hope people don't get comfortable. And that's the biggest fear I have because I do think that you have to do things like vote, I do think you have to participate and then move, shift. Of course, both of you disagree with my strategy, but shift over to transition over. And we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think what was interesting to me in reading, again, I, I don't know if people are quite appreciating this. We're talking essentially like this. this think about Dick Cheney and um, Hillary Clinton getting in a room and talking about how do we mobilize workers, right? How do we build a, a movement, a Black Lives Matter, right? If, they, if people like that are talking about mobilizing our movements for their political aims, right? Because that's what they're talking about here. Then that means that they feel very confident that those movements are in the, are in the back, all right? They won't, they're not gonna talk about mobilizing those movements if they felt like they would get out ahead of them if they were mobilized, right? And in the document, you'll read that they kind of say, well, they acknowledge, look, we don't have any of the acknowledged leaders of these movements here. So we, we gotta be a little careful, but we pretty mu they're pretty much saying, we'll mobilize these people for whatever we need to do to make sure Biden wins. That's what they say, right? Now, so that is telling to me, that tells me that they understand or they do not feel afraid in the least that once they get they get Biden, that there's going to be movements that are independent of the Democratic Party, um, and I think they're right. Um, but I will say that if they if if labor and if teachers are organized for a general strike, that um, that is to basically get Biden elected. That I think it might provide the opportunity for people like me to pose: Are we going to general strike to get Biden elected? But are we then going to strike? Because the district has just come out and said they're going to lay off a bunch of pairs, or they haven't said it, they've said it behind closed doors, that a bunch of pairs are going to lose their jobs by next semester. The question for our union is, are we going to strike in relationship to that? The answer really is no. Our union will strike to get Biden in power, not to save Paris jobs. That's the, that's the answer. But I think it will be my job, partially, to point out that what the hell are we doing striking to point to, to keep Biden in, in power, get him in power? We need to be using this power to protect ourselves and to defend ourselves and then to make a world that we are running that, that's not run by them. So that's why I participate. That's why I would have to participate, even though this is a strike, if it happens, that's literally there just to decide which capitalist exploiter you're going to get. Okay. I guess would you be trying to mobilize within your folks right. to 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 steer them 
to a different direction. Right. And it, I'd have very limited ability, but I think it is about making an argument with my colleagues and people who join me or who would be, who would be very excited to strike in order to defend Biden, but not excited to strike to defend a para. Like I would be trying to talk with them about inverting those priorities. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a question, right? Like, you know, because you can't make things happen from zero, at least I think right now, you know. And so obviously it's hard to get people motivated in, in you know, in, in the way like that I think, you know, and like what needs to happen. So, but, but it's important that, you know, if people engage, it's like, that's why, you know, I, there, I, I get frustrated. There's people that engage every two years when there is an election. And the easy thing is to shame them and to say, you know, you should have been here before. You should have been here. Or, you know, or people who have joined the immigration um, issue, you know, and like they, they, they seem to think that Trump was the, be the beginning and the end of this whole mess. Um, but yeah, my, my job, I think, you know, from my standpoint is to reel them in and show them what I, what I'm saying, you know, and hopefully it sticks, but, you know, ultimately the question is about, for me, the way I see it is power, you know, where does power lie, where does power shift, you know, and are you serving the same structure of power? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a. I, yeah, I, I like just like leave, and I would join. I would try to, you know, like wave my hands and say, "Hey, like, you know, have you thought about it this other way?" Um, or like, let's go beyond this. Like, this is not enough, you know. And I think that's all I can I can do really. But I think it could be an opportunity, um, you know, because obviously people will be brought into the fold in some weird way. But it, it's kind of my job to kind of, you know. I feel responsibility at least to say, hey, let's be more radical than this. It's actually, let's talk about power. One question I have is, do, do you all agree that this is likely to continue to play out in some legislative, whatever way, uh, court way up until late December, maybe early January, maybe up until inauguration? Do you agree with that or do you think it's going to be settled earlier? I believe the first one. You said into January? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. I think it's going to take a little while. I saw, I heard a scenario where um, there is an, um, a provision in the Constitution where it actually gives the votes to like state representatives and it's one vote per state. And so there is 26 like the uh, Republican controlled states. So there is a scenario apparently if they go to the constitution or whatever that where, you know, like basically it's just a suggestion like the, some guy, I don't, I forgot the name, I can get it later, but I saw this on the Jimmy Dore show if anyone wants to watch yeah. it. And so basically this uh, guy, investigative person who talks about um, fraud in Republican states and brought up the California issue He's saying, he's saying that that is a possibility that they could go to the, the constitutional record, recourse and where, where every state will vote. And so in that scenario, the Republicans win because they, they, they have to validate the votes. And obviously there is contention. Even some of the, the states that were called already for one or the other, they're too close. You know? And there is a mar there's obviously margin of error one way or the other or manipulation. <laughs> And then they both have a claim to that. Hmm. But I don't know. I, I, I think it's going to take a while. I, um, I don't know if it's going to be all the way to January. Hmm. Either way, you know, like I still got to do what I'm doing in my community. And, you know, and, and the way I see it is um, it's, it's a show. And I bring this up because um, it might, it's a little more related because I was watching this at work and I work at night. And everyone around me was watching this, and they they chose CNN to watch. Uh, you know, out of all the channels, CNN, I was pretty standard. But everyone realized that they were feeling anxiety over this, and because the way CNN presents the news is very, some people say it was a horse race, and other people other people say it was an auction. So it's like this high manic, you know, um, 
presentation of you know news and like so much um, hypotheticals and and confusion and and so yeah I mean and and, and like it's just crazy it's madness and. I don't know. I, I hope it gets resolved soon because my point is that that it causes anxiety. Even though I know all these things, like you know, I know what's kind of. I think I understand what's happening. Um, it still affects me. Like it affects people. And like today, I decided to go on a long hike rather than be on you know, in, in, on news watch or whatever. I don't know if this makes sense or is relevant, but I'm just sharing uh, that it's just. I don't know. I get. I hope it gets resolved. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, one way or the other, we still have to organize and fight back. And um, it does. It is concerning, like you said, Eduardo, that some people think that they can push Biden. Um, for example, I did have a conversation today regarding uh, DACA, you know, and someone that said, you know, yeah, I'll take DACA. I'll take. Hopefully, Biden will pass something. And and I asked the question, like, okay, well, you, you know, it'll probably be at the expense of someone else. Or something else like would you take you know like your path to legalization over an increased repression and persecution of other people including maybe some of your family members is that lesser of the two evils is that a band-aid you know and just to focus on one issue um and so either way we're screwed you know and i'm talking from my realm you know the, the immigration issue and um, we're still going to have to organize. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, <laughs> Kenny, uh, your anxiety. <laughs> yes, Jay. <Jill. laughs> I think everyone feels it, even if you're not one. If you, even if you don't really have that investment, it's everyone around you, you know, the environment. People are, uh, you know, I decided to eat cake yesterday for the, <laughs> I don't normally eat cake and I, but I need something to <laughs> pump me up even higher. <laughs> no. Anyhow, um, where was I going with this? Uh, I guess I'll just, I don't know what else. I guess in response to what you were saying, Kenny, I find it also sort of awful that I have given in to this sort of auction, what you were saying, horse race, vibe, feeling. I don't want to be that person. And I, and as, as I said here several times, I hope that people don't settle. And, but you can't help escape this political game. No? Everyone's talking about it. And when I was talking on, to some friends yesterday on a Zoom call, because they, they wanted to know how I was doing or something, I told them I was going to discuss on a Facebook Live with my friend Jake, a Trump voter, um, what what we make of this on a different angle. And they they're very cherished, loving friends, but they are very strong liberals. And they said, "Why would you do that? Why would you talk to them, or talk to him rather?" And don't you think that that's also giving a platform? to people who are you know to to platform to people who are um who are racists and and also there's a, communities are hurt right now this is not the time for you to be engaging with them and i try to explain that we need to amplify voices and we also need to sort of reach out to people who might not but then i i understood who, who, i understood that there was the wrong crowd to speak to them about this because they are Democrats. And it's that whole binary system. So how are we supposed, to, I guess where I'm going with this is how are we supposed to organize <laughs> right now when people are heavily divided, you know? Really, it's very camp, like this is the camp, this is the Democrat camp, Republican camp, camp excuse me. And it's really, really divided right now. And no matter how you try to, even both Republicans and Democrats, I find it difficult to speak to even Jake, who is just so concentrated on Trump. And my Democrat friends are, are so sided with. And 
I feel I'm going to lose friends because I, I, I'm trying to talk to everyone. Uh, so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Eduardo, this is the first time I've heard you say with, with, things are so divided. How do we organize? Or I'm like, Oh, I, I think I finally get what you're saying because I've usually been saying people aren't divided. They're united under two cap under two capitalist parties. Right. I've, I've said that before. Uh huh. But you are right, and that is a riddle that's that social. If we're going to organize the working class for something that will make the capitalists worry, those two sides of the working class are going to have to be in the same room talking it out and organizing together and doing something, you know. Um, and that is a and and so one of the things that is being talked about as the temperature is raised by the capitalists to make it seem like these two poles are so different, and we're going to keep people in their camps. Some people are talking about that as actual divisive strategy in the same way that we talk about racism as a division strategy and nationalism as a division strategy. And that's, that is probably true, even though I'm like, I've been saying, because I think Eduardo, when, when I've heard you say that we're so divided, and it's when I even will often say, uh, oh, that's not true because we're the working class is united under one capital, essentially under one capitalist party that's the Democratic and Republican Party. But that makes some sense. Um, so, because I do think we will have to, that that's going to have to be solved by by revolutionaries and by workers, those those political divides, um, where we actually can be in the same room and talk. And I think so. What you're doing with Jake, and the problems it fa faces for other friends is is something that leftists and libertarians and people on the right wing, but people who who approach it, this thing as a problem from below, are going to have to solve it. Um, it, I mean, it's interesting to me that <laughs> I remember when we talked about the the the, the 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 days when California was all red, like the Mars, you know, it looked like Mars, and and that put me in a good mood um, because the world looked like I think it is. <laughs> That's how I feel right now. <laughs> I've been in a good mood today <laughs> because I'm like, oh yeah, this is this is the world. This this ridiculous sham is the world and 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 i do understand the world because i thought this was going to happen and now it's happening and i'm not it's not good but it somehow makes me feel good to know okay i get it this is this is the world i'm dealing with um i will say talk to brandy i do care about the outcome because i believe that if biden is president I believe it's more likely that me and Brandy, when we get married, we'll be able to have a wedding without masks and we can put a hundred <laughs> people in a room. So I would like, for that reason, by, by the presidency, they're going to put this COVID thing away because they don't need it to go after Trump with. So I'll be able to have a wedding or I can invite two of you and Eduardo, maybe you won't have to wear a mask. So, a tr but the problem with the Biden presidency is even though I get to have the wedding I want, but I think they're going to force me to get a vaccine in order to work. So uh, that there's a, I got to figure out which one I want. So um, because I do believe that the Biden presidency will also mean a greater crackdown on civil liberties. Um, but I might get to have the wedding I want. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. Andy. Hey, I, I got it's, it's, That's a motto of socialism. I got to think about me first. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it. I think that that's where the problem is, right? Like the one of the big issues, because you know, like I I I always cringe when I hear you know Latinos. Why are these Latinos in Florida voting for Trump? You know, I have family from in SoCal that voted for Trump, friends that openly voted for Trump right now in California, and my brother actually has engaged with them um, because uh, in that part gives me hope that my brother has been able to recognize within himself and probably because he's outside this like liberal bubble and that, you know, he has conservative values. He has liberal values. He's a mix of both. He's not one fully or the other. Um, and I think that's where the hope is, you know, like people realize that we're not one thing or the other. Like, and in reality, the way I see it, the world is conservative. <laughs> You know, like look outside the world, look at, you know, most of the people are conservative. If you're going to approach it from those, you know, like moralistic arguments, we're not going to win. 
you know, so you have to sell something different, something that's, you know, that, that is relevant that for yourself, because if you're not fighting for yourself, you know, you can't offer anything than rhetoric and uh, good wishes to people. So that's what I, that's my approach to tell people that you should be worried that complain about your own situations because your mother is sick and they can't, even though you have a decent job, but your mother is struggling, you know, because you, when you're dating, you know, you have to choose between like moving out or not with someone because fucking rent is so high that you can afford your own space, you know, because if you get too sick, you're probably not going to be able to work and you're going to lose your insurance. And then you're going to have to go through a lot of bureaucratic bullshit, you know, while you still die, you know, because you're stressed over this bullshit. So my point is that, that that's what I, I want to offer something different, not in the moralistic terms, like shame on you and this shame on that, but find the common ground that you, you still got to wake up and go to work, you know, to make a living. And, you know, fundamentally, I think a lot of people on the right and the left want the same thing. And, and so that's what I choose to focus on. Like, if we, you know, like rather than not talk, you know, let's talk about what we have in common. Did your parent, did your mom vote? We have had discussions and they are leaning a little towards me more, you know, but I have conversations about private property with my mother, you know, who some people would dismiss. And my mom is a mix of conservative and, 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 and liberal. You know, I have that same conversation with my brother who only went to high school, you know, and like some people will dismiss because he has some conservative values, you know, and I have this conversation with like people in Nicaragua who are machista men because they grew up in that environment, but I know they will show up when shit hits the fan versus someone who just pays lip service to inclusion and justice and equality, like a lot of San Francisco teachers, <laughs> you know, like, and so that you know like i don't know i i think that my job as i could do consider myself a revolutionary is to reach on both sides and just speak my truth and see who wants to stick around and get punched in the face and still stick around <laughs> i was thinking about what do i want to come out of this i i i'm i have i struggle to answer that right now i am concerned about the voter turnout <laughs> it makes me worry that People are just, wow, really absorbed by this on a mass scale. But um, you're concerned about low or high voter high turnout? turnout? I'm concerned about high voter turnout. You know, Why are you so concerned of that? You're benefiting because of it. No, it, it, just, means, it just means the head fixing is working massively. But I, that's from, from, my, from my perspective. Um, but I, I think I will say that I am hoping that I figure out how, what it means to be a revolutionary in this time. I hope, I hope I continue to try to learn that, you know, and don't make the mistake because I do want to do the same thing both of you are doing. I want to talk to people on the right and people on the left and even some people in the bit in between, but without, you know, I don't get to talk to people who have just fixed themselves. They, they won't listen anyway. Um, but I don't want to make the mistake of trying to appeal to them by changing what I said. I want to be able to be me and see who, like what, it, what Kenny's saying. Um, because if, if you speak to diverse, a diverse audience, it, it doubles the chance that you might want to kind of change what you're saying in order to try to sway them or convince them. And so I think you have to be doubly aware to be like, to be sincere and to be true to yourself, which I think is hard, but I, I hope I can do that. I agree. I agree with that. I, I think I felt that last night where uh, some people were saying, um, who would vote for Trump? Honestly, who would vote for Trump? Those stupid people, those stupid people voting. And I looked over it and I thought, is that what I sound like? <laughs> 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 I said that. I hope not. <laughs> Maybe I need to rethink this. No. So, uh, so, uh, yeah. So I guess I, I uh, yeah. I don't. I don't. I want to talk to people, but I also don't want to 
um, I, you, said, you were mentioning about being doubly aware. I, I want to speak from truth. Yeah. And I don't want to lie either and sort of be like, yeah, yeah, me too. I think they're stupid people when I, when I, when I do think they're stupid people. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that gets cut out. Just be consistent. <laughs> Those deplorables. <laughs> oh, I don't, I, I, both people who are um, conservative or liberals, it is challenging to maintain yourself true to yourself. For me, my experience, for me. Being amongst my liberal friends, it's hard being around that sort of ambience. You know what it's like, Andy, being in school with other teachers, socially minded folks. It's hard to say something without hurting someone's feelings or getting really strong reactions, no? Yeah. Such as when I say I'm not voting for Joe Biden, for example. As simple as that. What? And then I have to calm down people and say California is going to vote for Joe Biden. Don't worry. Do I need to say that? You know, do I need to say that? But I say that in defense of don't counsel me or don't stay, don't, don't defriend me. You know? Yeah. And, and then I say something along the lines of, well, if I was in Florida, maybe I'd reconsider, you know, but I don't want to vote for Biden. Why would I say that? So I have to stay. That's what I'm trying to get at. And with conservatives as well. I don't want to sort of just nod my head every time they're bashing a certain group of a population like Muslims, yeah. where I do disagree with the Muslim ideology, but I also don't want to sort of, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. We don't want to also just right. be disparaging our brothers and sisters who are part of the same sort of working class that we are all part of. So I have to, you know, how do you stay true? I think that that is my, at least for me, those are the two that came up to me because those are recent. No? I think, you, honestly, Eduardo, I actually do think you do a pretty good job of that. So, go Biden. You know, every time you uh, keep me off a show, I'm going to come back angry. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Andy, what you have created? That's why I step back. <laughs> I step back. I said, just like Kenny steps back when me and Andy <laughs> this is my turn to step back. <laughs> uh, okay. So that does it for this week's episode. What's Left is a weekly political podcast as channel challenge to the mainstream left. We post information about our topics and our guests on the episode notes where you found this episode or on our blog at what s leftwebnodecom uh, you can find past episodes to this podcast slash channel there and connect with us. I remind folks that if you fancy anything you have heard here, please share your favorite episode, rate, review, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to any of our six platforms on Spotify, iTunes Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, BitChute, or YouTube, uh, where people like to post comments now and say things about me, bashing me. Maybe. Your friend Jake wasn't doing you right. <laughs> if you would like to give us feedback about something you've heard or suggest something for us to cover, contact us through our blog. I'm Eduardo Barca with co-host Andy Lipson and Kenny Cepeda. See you next time. Wear a mask. Stay safe. And wear a mask at Andy's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> You're invited either way, Eduardo. I, I'll take you mask or no mask. That's hilarious. All right. Ciao. <laughs>